tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening, you're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 5, Episode 17. I'm your host, Otis Jiry. In tonight's episode, I'll be performing five stories for you, and trying something a bit different than usual. All of the tales in this program are in the public domain. However, we're not talking about Edgar Allan Poe and Bram Stoker. Oh no. Not tonight. But tonight we'll be regaling you with a hand-picked selection of the Supernatural from Weird Tales magazine, originally published in December 1924's edition of the American fantasy and horror fiction pulp magazine that gave writers such as H.P. Lovecraft and Clark Ashton Smith their starts. And our featured authors may not be household names, but their tales, though largely forgotten, will be given new life today by yours truly. The authors of these stories may have passed away, but if I have anything to say about it, their ideas will live forever. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first three terrifying tales. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes, with twice the terror. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So, lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show's about to begin. <laughs> Our first tale tonight, a sordid story about quack surgery, comes to us from author Romeo Poole. In it, we'll visit a sanatorium operated by one Dr. Whitby, a man who is considered somewhat of a crackpot in the area. When an explosion and fire decimate the second floor of the building, leaving a patient critically injured, Whitby resorts to unusual means to rehabilitate his latest guinea pig. Without further ado, I present to you A Hand from the Deep. Somewhere near midnight, my room telephone rang, and according to well-formed habit, I rolled out of bed and answered almost before I was fully awake. Ambulance trip for you, Marsh. We'd be home. That brought me wide awake, and hustling into trousers, shoes, shirt, and white uniform coat, and descended to the main office. Dr. Lang, the superintendent, met me at the foot of the stairs with a heavy overcoat. Here, he said, put this on. It's a pretty chilly night. Here's your bandage, kid. You may need it. Ambulance in the back drive, explosion and fire out at the Whitby home. Send back for help if necessary. Now use some speed. 
I used some speed, and when I got into the ambulance, the driver used some more. We tore up the street at a hazardous rate, the chauffeur giving himself over to the task of driving, while I turned the crank that ran the shrieking signal horn. The so-called Whidbey Home was an obscure little institution occupying a shabby ten-room brick building in a low-class residence district in the outskirts of the city. The place bore a rather evil reputation, and it was hinted that its owner and operator, Dr. Whitby, was guilty of various illegal practices in connection with his hospital work. However, no complaint of any importance had ever been lodged against him, and consequently no investigation of his activities had ever taken place, and the general opinion of his character remained unconfirmed. For aught I knew, the rumors about Whitby might have been born of the natural resentment of all medical men toward a practitioner who declines to be governed by their standards and becomes, therefore, a quack. For Whitby had belonged to no medical society. He was careless about collecting anything for his work, and he practiced any kind of medical theory, old or new, that happened to appeal to him, totally disregarding the ethics of the profession. He had no general practice, and the inmates of his would-be sanitarium were usually people of little learning, and nearly always the victims of disabling accidents. I must mention, however, that my gratification at the thought of investigating the would-be home and some of its curious inmates entirely overcame my resentment at losing most of a night's sleep. In a matter of seconds, we drew up as near the place as we could get, at the fire department having the narrow street blocked. The building was almost completely gutted by the fire when we arrived, and grabbing my first aid kit, I ran up to the captain who was directing the firefighting to inquire about the victims. Only one alive. He panted. The rest all killed in the explosion. Come over here. The survivor, whose room had been on the ground floor, had not been injured by the accident, although he had been stunned temporarily by the shock of the explosion. The fireman had wrapped him in a blanket, salvaged from the burning house, and laid him in a sheltered place to await the ambulance. Passing the mangled bodies of the dead... We found him sitting up, looking a little dazed at the excitement, but feeling cheerful and apparently comfortable. He was a common-looking man, little, of probably thirty years, a laborer of not very extensive intellect, but alert and sensible in answering our questions. He had been staying at the place on account of the amputation of his left arm a little above the elbow. I sat by his side on the return to the hospital and questioned him regarding the cause of the fire. Gas or gasoline explosion, I guess. He responded readily. Fox, the fellow that did the odd work around the house, was in my room along about ten o'clock and sat there and talked to me a while. Finally, he said he smelled something like gasoline or escaping gas that seemed to come down the stairs, and he went up to see to it. After a while, I heard him open the door at the top of the stairs, and that's about all I knew till I come to, out there in the yard. Something must have blown the whole top of the house to pieces. I was lucky, for I was the only one that slept downstairs. Are any of the rest of them alive? Not a soul, told him. The patient's face betrayed genuine regret at this. Too bad. Doc Whitby was a good fellow. I got this arm cut off in a smash-up over at the barrel stave mill, and Doc Whitby just happened along before I even got it wrapped up, and he took me in and took care of it ever since, and never asked for a dollar. I had a couple weeks' wages with me, and I turned that over to him, but he didn't seem very anxious to get it. Wanted me to wait and see what a nice job he'd do on that arm, some new scheme he had. Arriving at the hospital, I installed my patient in a ward bed, 
made out his record card in the name he gave me, Simon Glaze, and then proceeded to look after the dressing on his arm, which I found soaking wet. I removed this and applied idioform gauze, dry, covering it with a linen bandage. Are you going to soak it up? he asked. Soak it? No. That's no way to take care of a stump. Doc Whitby kept it wet all the time. It's new to me, I told him. We always keep wounds like that clean and dry. You'll be all right with this dressing. Well, maybe, he said doubtfully as I left him. The next morning I went in for a look at my patient, who appeared to have spent a rather bad night. Doc, he began eagerly, couldn't you stretch a point and wet this bandage for me? I haven't slept a wink all night with that dry rag on it. I wondered what kind of faith cure Whitby had been practicing on Glaze, and I maintained my position that the wet bandage was not the proper treatment. Glaze stared at me with red, sleepless eyes, misery showing in every line of his face. Doc, he finally said, I want to talk to the regular top boss of this concern, and I want him pretty soon. We had considerable argument over this, but ultimately I went and brought up Dr. Lang in compliance with Glaze's request. Glaze had been lying face down on his bed during my absence, and when Dr. Lang and I returned, we opened the felted door with its silent latch without a particle of noise and stepped into the room before Glaze was aware of our approach. Dr. Lang started to speak, and his heavy voice broke on the stillness of the room with quite a jar. The effect on the patient was most startling. He gathered his legs and his good arm under him like a flash and sprang backward, clear onto the next bed, which fortunately for its occupant was empty at the time, the patient being in the dressing room. Lang gasped. Ha <laughs> ha, metal case, as I might have suspected. He crossed quickly to where the patient lay, still crouched in the same posture, speechless, doubled up. The doctor laid a hand on him, spoke to him, turned him over on his back, all without evoking a word from Glaze, who lay with his eyes half-closed, like a man playing dead. "'Well, let's have a look at the arm, anyhow,' said Lang, and he proceeded to uncover the unresisting man's stump. "'Bad-looking job,' he commented. No infection, but just doesn't look right. I suppose Whitby was trying some wildcat scheme on him, and so long as he has no infection, maybe we better continue it for a while, just to keep him calmed down. Then we'll gradually break in on some reliable, modern treatment. Didn't you say it was perfectly rational last night? It certainly was. Next time he has a lucid interval, just call me, will you, Marsh? No matter what I'm doing, this is an interesting case, and I'd like to know what the late Whitby has been doing to him. Sometime later in the day, Glaze recovered his poise, and Dr. Lang talked to him at length, questioning him about the treatment administered by Dr. Whitby, but the answers only increased our curiosity. Glaze admitted that he had been under chloroform a number of times since Whitby had first cared for his arm stump, which seemed rather unusual to us. Questioned as to the purpose of this, he said he didn't believe the arm had ever been touched when he was under the anesthetic, as it was never sore afterwards. There was an injury in the roof of his mouth that bled a good deal, he said, and there were little sore spots on his back that were quite painful for a day or two. And then, he finished, there was a good deal of time I can't remember at all. Guess I kind of was feverish or something, for there's long stretches of time that go by that I can't remember anything. This morning was one of them. And, say, Doctor, I wonder if you could fix it so I could have a bath pretty often. Say, every day or twice a day? I don't want much hot water. Just plain gold water is good enough for me. Dr. Whitby always let me bathe two or three times a day, 
and I just can't seem to get enough of it. Dr. Lang was interested enough to assent to this, although he hardly expected to collect a cent from the patient. He was retaining Glaze for the satisfaction of his private curiosity. That's the weirdest case I've ever saw or heard of, said Lang to me later. Call it intermittent insanity if you want to, but he hasn't a trace of fever, nor a sign of locomotive ataxia, both of which lunatics practically always have. In fact, when he is in those silent fits, his temperature is actually below normal, and how he takes to water. Whatever is wrong with him, it isn't hydrophobia. I prepared Glaze's bath for him several times, and he demanded water that was practically unheated. Although the time was early winter and the temperature outside well below freezing, Glaze was removed to a room by himself with a bath attached where his eccentricities would bother no one else, and during the next two weeks he showed very little change in symptoms. I was careful not to startle him unduly, but even under the most careful treatment, he still showed that curious inclination to double up into a ball and go backward, always backward, away from anyone who approached him. His talkative intervals grew shorter, and if allowed, he would spend hours in his tub of cold water, hardly moving a muscle. Making an examination of the arm stump one morning, I noted for the first time three or four little warty growths of the suture where the skin had been drawn together over the stump. As the patient was feeling apparently normal at the time, I held a hand mirror up to the stump so that he could see the warts, too, and told him they would probably have to be cut off. He looked intently at the reflection of the end of the stump for a few seconds, then turned to me uh, with a startled expression on his face and voice. I don't cut him off, he pleaded, and on the instant he doubled up into a ball again, rolling on the floor of the dressing room like a wooden thing. When I told Dr. Lang of the incident, his curiosity at Glaze's behavior put a severe strain on the good doctor's self-control. If that man Whitby were alive today, he remarked with studied restraint, I'd be inclined to put him on the operating table and persuade the truth out of him with a red-hot iron. It's some devilish work of his that makes a man act like a dried armadillo every time anyone looks at him. And that subnormal temperature, where does he get it? Two days later, we took the somewhat unwilling glaze into the operating room to care for his unhealthy stump. Dr. Lang, of course, superintended the work, and the actual cutting had been turned over to my fellow intern, a young Irishman named Lancy, with a flaming red head and a likable manner, whom everyone considered to be destined for a brilliant future. As I gradually whiffed the ether into the patient's nostrils, Lancy was busy unwrapping the stump. When the cut-off member was exposed, Lancy's eyes rested for only a second on the bits of flesh she was expected to remove, then his whole face changed as if he had been struck with a club. Oh, the cats! He gasped, his lips turning gray-white. Cut out the ether, Marsh. I don't want to operate on that. I stopped and turned toward Dr. Lang, who was uh, a little nonplussed at Lancey's sudden refusal to carry out his commission. Pardon my abruptness, Doctor apologized Lancy to his superior. But I'd like to have six or seven days' time before going ahead with this cutting. You'd like it. Yes, Doctor. If you'll give me a week before you disturb this man's arm, I think I can tell you something about the Honorable Dr. Whitby's work that'll make your eyes open. But I've just got to have that much time. One week ruminated the superintendent slowly. Won't kill nor cure him in his present condition. 
I presume we can wait that long. But aren't you forgetting that I am in charge here, and that this man is being kept here solely on my responsibility? Do you have to be so extremely reticent with your theories? I feel that I'm entitled to know something about what you think you've discovered. I know what Whitby has done, said Lancey simply, and in a week I can tell you what he did it with. Can I have that much time? Yes, take your week, exploded the doctor with some irritation, but I'm holding you strictly responsible for the condition of this patient. That's all right, that's what I want. And I still think you might give me an idea of what you're talking about. Take a look at that, then, pointing to the bare stump. Dr. Lang scrutinized the growth, as he had not recently been reading on the subject that had given Lancey his sudden inspiration. It is possible that he did not see anything definite on Glaze's arm. Also, it is possible that in his dignified conservatism, he doubted even his own eyesight. But as he retreated, dissatisfied and silent, I bent close and looked. What I saw took my breath away and made me wonder if I were really awake. Lancey hurried away, and I trundled the unconscious Glaze back to his bed. During the next two days, Glaze lost nearly all that was left of his normal human instincts and in speech. He moved and obeyed mechanically when spoken to, but seemed to understand motion better than speech, so that it was often necessary for me to point to a thing in order to make him comprehend what I wanted. His mania for the cold bath increased, and if I went into his room quietly in the early morning, I frequently found him doubled into the familiar ball, sleeping with his eyes half open. Observing Glaze's eyes so much brought out another revelation. Upon first seeing the man, I had noticed his bright, intelligent-looking eyes, which were rather prominent. But now, since his recent prolonged lapses into semi-consciousness, I noticed that his eyes were sunk deeper into his head and seemed to be losing their luster. Now, this condition might be induced by anemia or something of the sort, but Glaze was in the pink of physical condition, and not in the least emaciated, and I was at a loss to explain the exchange in his eyes. He had certainly grown less talkative at the same time, and vaguely I wondered if something were influencing a part of his brain, causing it to shrink and thus by natural consequence, causing his eyes to sink further back into the bony structure. As I sat observing him, it suddenly struck me that the crown of his head seemed to be less prominent than when I first saw him, and after a careful survey, I was positive that the man's head was losing its prominent crown and sinking into a more brutish line. Of course, any physician knows that a man's skull can change shape in the course of time if something happens to develop a new portion of his brain just as the bones in a coal heaver's shoulders bend under the heavy loads. But a change like that in one skull would hardly be perceptible in less than two or three years, and the apparent alteration in the shape of Glaze's skull in the three weeks we had known him seemed like a preposterous dream of some kind. Not wishing further to upset my good superior, Dr. Lang, I kept still about this weird discovery until Lancey returned to the hospital that evening, he having been out by special permission all day. Late that night, I brought Lancey up and told him about the patient's eyes and asked him what he could see in the shape of his head. While Glaze lay in his habitual stupor, Lancey felt of his head and turned it right and left. Then he placed his hands in behind him and said, It all fits together, perfectly, but my God, where will it end? I could only stare at my friend. I've got it, Marsh. I've got the whole story, up to date. I've got the whole story up to date. 
and I don't know, but that it would be a kind deed to chloroform this poor wretch and let him out of it. I never dreamed it would work so fast. Tomorrow, Marsh, I'll tell you all of it that I've found out. And Lancey went back to the laboratory. I now studied Glaze's habits more closely than ever, for I did want to get some idea about the mysterious case before Lancey had to tell me every detail as if I were a child. Glaze was not inactive all the time. He varied between his rolled-up playing dead attitude and suddenly snappy erratic movements. He was beginning to snap at his food and devour it hastily, almost without chewing, and this habit caused him some little stomatic disturbances, as, of course, it would with anybody. In his frequent visits to the bathtub, he would dive for longer periods underneath the surface of the water and come up half-strangled, yet seeming to enjoy it all. And if anything surprised or startled him, it was always backward that he retreated from it, backward and suddenly. Finding time to visit Glaze alone in the afternoon, I dropped into his room and found him sitting up in his chair, apparently his old cheerful self. I spoke to him gently and without startling him, and he smiled and looked as if he would like to reply, but simply could not. Hoping to draw him out into one more conversation, I sat down beside him and continued talking to him about little things around the house with which he was familiar. Finally, and successful in getting Glaze to talk, I playfully shook hands with him, preparing to leave. The hand that gripped mine nearly broke three of my fingers, and the smile left Glaze's face as he shut down on me with a grip of inhuman strength. Tugging at his hand with my own left, in an effort to free my sadly pinched right member, I saw that his thumb reached clear across my own very large palm and had almost an inch to spare. How could I have escaped noticing that huge thumb before? Then I saw the nail. It bore a sharp ridge, like the gable roof of a house, down its center, and it occupied the entire end joint of that monstrous thumb. This certainly had not been the case when I had held Glaze's right hand a few days previously while administering chloroform to him. When I finally extricated my right hand, Glaze kept opening and shutting that huge pincher with a motion that reminded me of the jaws of a hungry alligator. What was this superhuman influence that caused a man's firmest tissues to alter their shape completely within a few hours? And what was it that that ghastly, gripping claw resembled? I left the room with cold chills, running up my spine. The next morning, Lancey arranged to explain to Dr. Lang, two or three other doctors who had become interested, and myself, regarding his findings about the mysterious patient, for which purpose they gathered in Dr. Lang's back office at 10.30 o'clock you may be assured that it was a highly interested little group that gathered in that room considerably before 10.30, Dr. Lang himself being almost rapidly impatient. Well, shoot, Lancey, he said before the door had closed behind the last man. And Lancey shot. There's just one man in the room, I think, who saw and understood what was growing on the end of our patient's arm a week ago today. At that time, it was four perfectly good little fingers and a model thumb. This statement was greeted with voiceless gasps. It's certainly different now. In fact, I hardly know what to call it in its present form, but we'll go up and look at it presently. Anyhow, it is now perfectly plain that what Whitby tried to do, and partially succeeded in doing, was to modify the regenerative processes in his patients so that a new forearm would grow in place of the lost one. The theory is nothing very new. As early as 1906, 
It was observed that when a limb is amputated at the middle of a bone, the bone starts to grow out again, but increases only about one-fifteenth of an inch in length before it is halted by some other influence. You also know, of course, about the little warts of so-called proud flesh that apparently try to replace the original muscular tissue in case of injuries, but which are misshapen or misplaced. What Whitby was trying to get at, as I see it, was to so control these misdirected efforts of nature as to produce a new and perfect limb. The human body is already able to repair damaged bones by rebuilding small particles to the bone's tissue. It is also able to replace muscle, nerve, and even fingernail tissue, although in somewhat imperfect forms. Whitby was trying to induce it to build a lost member in perfect form. Seeking this result, his studies naturally took him to observing the water animals that have this power of regeneration. A crab, for instance, when it gets a limb broken, promptly bites off the rest of the limb, and a new one grows in its place. The same is true of the lobster family, down to the crawdad, no larger than a cricket. Specimens of these little creatures are frequently found with one limb far smaller than the others as a result of such occurrences. It seems that Whitby had been experimenting for years with the duetless and other glands of shellfish in pursuance of this theory of regeneration, and we have upstairs the living proof that he was able to prepare a glandular extract that changes the bodily cell structure as well as influencing the building up process of nature. But it appears that he never succeeded in isolating the one influence from the other, both being present in his preparation. I have found that Whitby bought the little crawdads, which are really dwarf lobsters, from children around his neighborhood, and that his purchases ran into tens of thousands of those little creatures. And I also find that he bought live lobsters in a quantity that his dining table would never have warranted. In short, this patient, Simon Glaze, has had his body so saturated with the glandular extracts from lobsters that he has actually developed regenerative powers, and the bits of proud flesh on his arm stump, which you only saw a week ago, became quite well-developed fingers. At that time, of course, they were getting natural human material from their reconstruction. All of that has changed now, and as a result of the other influence of his medication, he's now coming more and more every day to resemble a gigantic shellfish in both body and mind, if a shellfish can be credited with a mind. You remember what he told about a wound in the top of his mouth? That was the easiest access to the region of the pituitary gland the seed of powerful influence over any structural change in the man's body. Other injections were administered along his spinal column, and I firmly believe that Whitby was successful in providing the man with something that he has used since Whitby's death in promoting the change, not understanding the real results. I objected a moment to state that Glaze had positively had possession of nothing he had brought from the Whitby home. At that, Dr. Lang leaped to his feet, suppressing an oath. I've got it, he ejaculated, his steel blue eyes snapping. This infernal lunatic Whitby was afraid somebody would take his patient away from him before he got through his nice little experiments. So he just lodged bodies of oil-soluble extracts along his spinal column, where they would continue to be picked up in the limb. In this way, he had gone on poisoning and wrecking this poor soul wretch of a labor, after he himself is dead, and in wherever such people belong. We'll go up now and have an x-ray made, and see if anything else can be done. The unfinished lecture broke up, and Lancy, Lang, and I 
went up to Glaze's room immediately. As we waited for the elevator, Lancy finished explaining to Dr. Lang, That nice little set of fingers has now turned to an almost perfect lobster claw, only two fingers of the original five having developed, both with scissor-like claws. His good right hand is today nearer a lobster claw than anything else. His speech is gone. His temperature is 93 degrees instead of a normal 98. His backward leaps, when startled, are the behavior of a crawfish and the occipital bones of his head are shrinking day by day. Above all, notice fondness for water, especially on his stump. A crab would not grow a new limb except in a wet place. We hurried into Glaze's room and on into the bathroom beyond where he spent so much time. In the tub full of cold water, we found Glaze's nude body doubled and curled up, face far down under the water, dead. Poor devil, said Lacey, as we extracted the body and laid it upon the bed. His lobster brain taught him that the only safe place for him was under water, but he lacked the lobster's breathing apparatus. Well, it's better this way, after all. I hope you enjoyed A Hand from the Deep by author Romeo Poole, as performed by yours truly. Up next, we've got a second terrifying tale for you. This one from author Anthony D. Keogh, a gentleman that began writing stories when he was about 16 and made his first sale four years later. In tonight's tale, his first and only submission to Weird Tales, We'll visit a haunted house and delve into the mysteries of a secret society with less than altruistic intentions. Without further ado, I present to you The Silent Five. Beneath a scrawny tree, two shadowy figures stood whispering. He's bought the place and says that he'll stay growled the first. It must be removed by the 13th. You know the law. I'll find a way. Give me number three to help. I'll see three tonight. Silence forever. The five supreme answered the first shadow. His voice, as he finished, ascended in pitch to a ridiculous squeak. Solemnly saluting, the two men melted away into the darkness. Seven nights later, John Kiefer crashed wildly out of his house and sped over the dank lawn before it, screaming like a man who is tottering on the brink of insanity. Then his feet found the weed-encrusted brick wall, which, strangely enough, afforded him some relief. As he was a man of courage, his cries subsided, and he turned and looked behind him at the place he called home. Above him it loomed, weird and menacing. Over to the left, a green slit of window betrayed the library he had left so hurriedly. John Kiefer shuddered. He was cold as well as afraid, for he was attired in only his bathrobe and slippers. Suddenly he faced about, and with a wary eye over one shoulder, marched off down the road, fearful at every step that something would drift from that evil room to strangle him. Before he had taken a dozen steps, he stopped and listened. Drawing nearer, another pair of feet rasped the pavement. Kiefer wished with all his soul that he had a gun or a pocket knife or a club or anything that would lend comfort to a man on a lonesome road at a lonely hour of the night. His spirits had acquired such a pessimistic hue that the possibility of the newcomer being anyone else other than a thug never entered his head. Whoever he was, he must pass under that street lamp. 
Ah, sighed Kiefer. Next door neighbor, and in his hand an ugly cane. No doubt aroused by the turmoil, he'd come down the road to investigate. Kiefer knew him slightly, but at this moment felt sweep over him a great wave of fondness, almost affection for this man. Smith, he said, I am certainly glad to see you. He earnestly shook Smith's hand. Um, replied Smith. Kiefer thought he could read in his eyes the suspicion that he, Kiefer, had been drinking. Perhaps Smith had never formed a habit of meeting elderly gentlemen attired in bathrobes, promenading the streets in the chill hours of the morning. John was irritated anyway, feeling as undignified and helpless as a man in a barber chair. And so he condemned Smith's lack of confidence, swearing and cursing fluently. Smith stared at him a moment, torn between a desire to laugh and rage at Kiefer's scathing remarks. I didn't say a word about drink, my friend. Let me help you home to bed. No, no, for the love of heaven, don't go near that house. He spoke with such feeling that Smith was impressed. Kiefer saw his advantage and seized Smith's arm. Come on, if you'll put me up for the night, I'll tell you all about it. This last remark was a bribe. He knew that Smith, being a lawyer, must have a well-developed bump of curiosity, whether the bump concerned itself with spirits of the earthly or heavenly variety, troubled him not at all if it would put any roof over his head but his own. A moment's thought, and Smith nodded assent to John's proposal. He was not the whole-souled, back-slapping cordiality of the usual host, for he felt rather doubtful of John, and feared that he might prove troublesome before long. After a short walk, they reached Smith's home, a small place that radiated a cozy, common-sense atmosphere, and made Kiefer feel less skeptical about the solidity of the universe. Smith brought Kiefer into his den. Kiefer knew that it was his den, for the walls of the room looked as if they had been transplanted from a sporting goods store. Drawing chairs up to a newly awakened fire, Smith reached a box of cigars from under a table. When he had enveloped himself in a cloud of soothing Havana, he spoke to Kiefer. Now for the story. Tomorrow's Sunday and I can sleep late, so you can go as far as you like. Kiefer seemed to be dreaming with his eyes open. The ash on his cigar grew long and finally fell, tiny gray heap upon the carpet. Sharp-eyed Smith noted that his hand trembled. He began abruptly. Maybe you think I've been drinking, but I haven't. Don't use liquor. For most of my life has been spent in the tropics, where such a thing would be suicidal. No more than any other man, I've never believed in ghosts or such stuff. But tonight, Eyes dark with thought, Kiefer seemed to be staring through Smith into the past. Smith squirmed uneasily. Then Kiefer again took up his story, a tinge of horror in his voice. I live by myself and work into the small hours of the morning upon a book I'm writing. Several nights ago, there came three taps on my window, and the door behind my back swung open. It was touched by no living man, for I was in the hall before anyone could have gotten away. Next night, at the same hour, same thing happened. This time I had the curtain windows drawn apart and could see that no one touched the glass. Tonight, after the taps and after the door had opened, I became conscious of a presence behind me. Perhaps you know the feeling. A sort of sixth sense is the cause of it. I forced myself to turn and look. There stood a huge, shapeless, grinning black thing with hands outstretched for my throat. I suppose I played the baby. My nerves are unstrung anyway from a fever I picked up in the South. For the time, I became a howling lunatic with but one thought. 
to get out of that room and get out quick. I felt like a man in a nightmare. Paralyzed, could hardly lift my feet. I knew that the monster behind me was gaining in leaps and bounds. About the time I came to myself, you happened along. Kiefer relapsed into glum silence, and Smith, between puffs, studied him. Smith was no fool, and could see that he was entertaining a man of intelligence, perhaps a celebrity in a small way. Then he cross-examined Kiefer. Bit by bit, he took his story apart, and scrutinized the pieces carefully. Got any servants, he questioned. Told you I hadn't. Seen anybody wandering around your place lately? No. Some time ago, though, I chased away an Italian. What? An Italian? Yes. Nothing peculiar about that. He said that he had come up from the railroad and he didn't know my house was occupied and was taking a shortcut through to town. You know my grounds run back near a mile to the railroad. Hmm, grunted Smith. There may be something in this. You see, there's a story. Ah, rats. It's impossible. We'll look over things in the morning. Over an excellent breakfast, Kiefer met Smith's wife, a fluffy little creature who, true to the nature of women, viewed the events of the night before from an alarmingly superstitious angle. Blue eyes wide with excitement, she told of the man who had last lived in Kiefer's home. He had been an artist. With his wife, he lived in a sort of modest comfort. Then one day he returned home to learn that his wife had cast her lot with another man who could give her fine clothes. He promptly hanged himself in the attic, and his body hung undiscovered for five days. And ever since, she finished, his spirit has haunted that house, and that's what they say, anyway. This sad tale added to Kiefer's downcast spirits. He hurriedly gulped down a cup of hot coffee to hide his emotion. Smith's wife seemed troubled. But that's not the worst of it, she began. I don't know how true it is. Happening to glance at her husband, she stopped suddenly, for he was madly motioning her to be silent. As far as ghosts are concerned, Smith interrupted, I'm a skeptic. Let's take a look at your haunted house. Pushing back their chairs and reinforcing themselves with the friendly aroma of several more of Smith's cigars, they sauntered off down the road on their ghost hunt. Gray-headed Kiefer, attired in a dashingly modern suit of Smith's clothes, made an appearance that would have given the tailor the nightmare. Groomy old place, Smith ventured, surveying Kiefer's home with disfavor. Kiefer said nothing. His eyes seemed to reflect the melancholy stare of its vacant windows. Smith suddenly became interested in a scrawny little tree abreast the library. He examined its bark and then followed Kiefer through the French window that had served as a means of hasty exit the night before. The room had the earmarks that sometimes betray a bachelor's establishment. Papers thrown about, dust, and a general air of untidiness. The green student lamp was still burning, its sickly glow battling hopelessly with a glorious burst of sunshine from the uncurtained windows. Smith took inventory of the room, walking around hands in pockets, and finally arriving at the windows. Oh, he cried, with the air of a man who had just made a significant discovery. He stepped through the window onto the porch and picked from the window pane a tiny, flattened white ball. Hard dough he pronounced, after tasting it. Then he rummaged around under the window and found several similar balls. Kiefer took little interest in his strange antics, but Smith seemed to be greatly encouraged. Lead me to that door, he commanded, the one that opens. Kiefer pointed to the door. Smith turned the knob and then released it. The door, of its own weight, swung ponderously open. 
leaving a gap of perhaps a foot, it stopped, and Smith stepped into the murky hallway. As his eyes became accustomed to the gloom, he discerned towering walls covered with moldy tapestries, and in the foreground, a massive flight of stairs. The floor and stairway were hidden beneath a heavy carpeting into which his feet sank without sound. Kiefer stood behind Smith in the doorway, and Smith moved aside to allow him to pass, taking his hand from the knob on the outside of the door. To his surprise, his fingers stuck to its lower surface. He examined the knob, picking from it several wads of a dark, sticky substance. Aha! He announced another discovery. Do you chew gum? He asked Kiefer, who scowled at this seemingly irrelevant remark. No. Then how come you've got it stuck all over your doorknob? Maybe that artist's wife. No artist's wife ever enjoyed this gum, although I'd believe it of her. It's soft and sticky. You know how gum hardens in a few days after it's been untrued? Uh-huh, vaguely answered Kiefer. Smith went down on his hands and knees uh, to search the floor. His fingers plunged into a small round hole. What's this? he asked. It leads to the basement, Kiefer explained. Used to be a speaking tube there, I believe. There's another one, if you get any pleasure out of them. He pointed to a similar hole in the wall running into the library at the height of his head. Smith sat down on the floor, staring in turn at the doorknob and at the two holes. Item number two for the little black book, he murmured softly. They went back into the library. Where did you see that ghost, he questioned. Kiefer indicated the spot. It seemed to be between that tapestry and my chair. Smith inspected the tapestry, which occupied nearly one half of the wall opposite the windows. It was of a faded yellow, the figures traced on its surface so blurred that they seemed to blend into the background. He sounded the wall behind it, finding it as honestly solid as any wall should be. Sure you had all the doors and windows locked. Locked and double bolted after that first night. Why didn't you lock that ball door? The one with the chewing gum knob. Kiefer hesitated. Put it down to stubbornness, if you like. No man or beast ever before bluffed me. If anything wanted to come through that door, it could. And I would settle matters with it on this side. I was knocked off my balance, but leaving that door unlocked preserved some of my self-respect. I see, nodded Smith. A careful examination of dust-coated windowsills and floors throughout the house failed to discover traces of a midnight prowler. The dining room looked as if it had been unused for decades. A huge polished surface table occupied the center of the room, and in one corner stood a massive clock. After examining the dust-coated tabletop and the motionless clock pendulum, Smith shook his head in relief. Finally, he asked to see the basement. Kiefer led the way down a flight of rickety steps. Smith stood on a box and tried the window. It swung noiselessly open. He tried to squeeze through. Had his body been several inches less in diameter, he might have made it. But although Smith was not a large man, passage for him through that window was as effectually barred as if the window had never existed. He facetiously shook his finger at it. You could tell tales, he whispered. Then Smith prowled about in the semi-darkness until he found a pyramid of boxes in the center of the floor. With a lighted match, he examined the topmost box, snorting at what he saw. He snorted again in much the same way when he shifted his gaze to the ceiling directly overhead. All right, let's go. No more down here. 
Again in the library, he seated himself opposite Kiefer, who was sourly frowning. Has anybody got a live, healthy grudge against you? Queried Smith. Not to my knowledge. Smith's manner became grave. You said you were in the tropics. Did you ever have anything to do with the Kermora? No. Well, all this looks to me like the work of some filthy foreign secret society. I'll tell you what I make of it. Two persons are running this thing, and they certainly show a diabolical cunning. One of them crawls through that cellar window. Don't ask me how. He needs a wad of chewing gum between his jaws. Up the cellar steps he goes, and along the carpet in your hall. When he reaches the door, he takes from his pocket a piece of cord like this, which I found on the cellar floor. He buries one end of the cord in the gum and sticks it to the doorknob in such a way that when the cord is run through that hole in the floor and he yanks on it from his perch on the pile of boxes in the basement, the doorknob turns and the door swings open. A harder tug will, of course, detach the cord from the gum and almost destroy all evidence. I suppose the fellow in the basement starts the fireworks from his end when he hears the taps on the window. But my friend, said Kiefer, who tapped on the window, and how? Very simple, assumed Smith, feeling that he had the raw material of a clever detective. It struck me all in a flash. He used a blowgun, or a bean shooter, so that he wouldn't make any noise, and shot dough balls at your window from that tree outside. Its bark is scraped off in places, showing that somebody climbed it recently. Here are several of the wads of dough and the chewing gum I picked off the knob. See the track of the cord of the gum? And notice how that ball was flattened on one side when it hit your window. But how about the black monster? queried Kiefer, leaning back in his chair. That will take a lot of explaining. Yes, it will. I suggested that we let it rest for a while, but there's something I think I better tell you. Several months ago, before you moved in, two boys were taking the shortcut through your place from the railroad. They saw lights in the dining room and peeped through the shutters to see who was inside. What they saw frightened them half to death. Around the table stood five black-robed figures, all watching the clock, which had begun to strike twelve. They didn't wait to see more, but ran for their lives. The next day, feeling bolder, perhaps, they went back. They found the back door open, the dust rubbed off the dining room table, and the clock going. That's the story they told. Somehow I never put much faith in it until today. Then, too, a neighbor, walking past, swore he saw lights in the dining room. The funny part of it is, the lights were seen each time on the 13th of the month. Tonight is the 13th. Well, what shall we do about it? We better wait for them. I think you've got mixed up with a gang of cutthroats who have made this house their hangout, probably because they know it's avoided as being haunted. They're playing with you, in cat and mouse fashion. Yes, we'll wait. This isn't Italy. I'll see if a man can be chased out of his own home. The more Kiefer thought about it, the angrier he got. Blue veins appeared in his face, and he gripped the arms of his chair spasmodically. After talking a while, they left, dining at Smith's table. Night was falling when they returned for their vigil. Before leaving home, Smith had carelessly dropped a revolver into his pocket. Kiefer outlined their plan of action and prepared the stage for the coming of the villain. He left the windows unlatched and lit the green student lamp. Smith, he seated in a corner so that he could not be seen from outside. Then he placed himself at his desk, where he worked furiously from time to time delving into weighty volumes piled within reach of his arm. 
Once his coat swung against the arm of his chair, giving forth a metallic thud, which is foreign to the habits of an ordinary coat under such circumstances. Gun, breathed Smith. The silence was broken only by the furious scratching of Kiefer's pen. As time wore on, the tensions increased until Smith felt an insane desire to jump to his feet and yell. He'd wound the clock in the dining room and had boomed out the passing hours. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. Then came Kiefer's hushed voice, almost a whisper. His lips scarcely moved and the pen scratched on. Ready. I heard a step. Smith started violently. Time passed and nothing happened. Suddenly there came a tap on the window, then another and another. The doorknob jerked, squeaked, and the door slowly swung on its hinges. Smith felt that he would strangle from the furious throbbing of the pulses in his throat. He awaited the signal from Kiefer, whose actions portrayed the most abject terror. Then a long cone of light shot out from the tree before the window and rested on the tapestry. Kiefer's black monster. Now, barked Kiefer, whirling in his chair and leaping for the window. Smith by his side, he raced for the little tree. For an instant, the light glinted on two drawn revolvers. Then it was extinguished, and there came a scraping sound. Rounding a clump of bushes, they saw a shadowy figure flying diagonally across the lawn toward a walk that led to the back of the house. Kiefer sank his fingers into his companion's wrist. Crazed by the manhunt, Smith had raised his gun to shoot. Back toward the rear of the house they sped, feet crunching on the gravel walk. When they reached the end of the path, the fugitive in front was joined by another who must have come from the basement. The four crashed wildly down the garden, leaping bushes, dodging trees, the gap between them narrowing but a trifle. A pale moon cast patches of ghostly light through the trees. It was like a scene taken from a fairy book. Demons pursued by the forces of good for the two in the lead fled soundlessly and were black from head to foot. Suddenly one of the demons half turned and hurled something at Smith's head. He caught it as it flew by and as he ran examined it, finding it to be an electric flashlight. Then the fugitives curved to the left and a patch of fire, a winking red eye, appeared. It rapidly drew nearer. Kiefer was in the lead. In a moment, the two in front came within the glare cast by the flames of a campfire. Kiefer grunted, There's the rest of them, and forced more speed from his aching legs. Anger had given him endurance. Then one of the demons shouted, Run! Run! Old Whiskers is after us! And upon the last word, his voice rose to a ridiculous squeak after the fashion of a boy whose voice is changing. Kiefer and Smith, upon their heels, smashed through the brush and out into a little clearing. In the center was a fire, and over the fire a pot was bubbling. Three black-robed figures rose to their feet to flee, but it was too late. Stop, or I'll drill you, snarled Kiefer, waving his revolver. Smith came alongside and exhibited his artillery. Simultaneously, the five halted, and ten hands went into the air. "'Tear off that black stuff. Let's have a look at you,' commanded Kiefer. The five obediently struggled a moment, and off came the black, sack-like garments, revealing five boys ghost-white. "'Sainted God, Mother!' cried Smith, breaking the silence. Kiefer's face changed expression. Then he replaced his gun in his pocket, sat down upon the log and laughed loud, long, and heartily. He slapped and slapped his knee. It seemed tied to his voice, for at the very slap there came a fresh burst of guffaws. Did, did you kids work that knob 
And do all those things, ventured Smith. Uh huh. Why? Well, we wanted to scare old man, Mr. Kiefer, out of here by making him think his house was haunted. But why scare him out? Well, you see, this is the Silent Five, and we meet at 12 midnight on the 13th of every month in the old haunted house. Tonight's the 13th, and we couldn't meet with him there. He, he wouldn't let us. You cold-blooded, ruthless scoundrel. Kiefer gurgled. Things weren't clear to Smith yet. How did you make that black monster, he asked. The boy smiled wanly. I read it in a library book. Flash that light in your hand. Smith pressed the button, and then he had the answer to the riddle. The light was fitted with double lenses, and on the inner lens was painted a miniature of Kiefer's ghost. I shined it on that big yellow curtain, and it sure worked fine. You see, Mr. Kiefer looks like a sort of nervous person, and we figured we could get away with all this stuff. You had me on the way to the madhouse, said Kiefer, wiping his eyes. Now, I'll tell you what. You admit Smith and me to membership in your order, and I'll let you hold your meetings in my dining room, all right? Then, as it's not twelve yet... We'll hold the usual meeting in the usual place. At first, let's eat. I think those potatoes in the fire are about done. Smith, have a boiled potato? I hope you enjoyed The Silent Five by author Anthony D. Keogh as performed by yours truly. Up next, we've got a third taste of frightening fiction for you, in the form of a tale from author Dennis Francis Hannigan. In it, we'll travel beyond the door of death, but what exactly is waiting on the other side? Stay tuned and find out. Without further ado, I present to you, After. It was the morning after my execution. I had been clumsily electrocuted. But in America, such things are only too frequent. However, I cared little now for the malpractices of judges, juries, and executioners. It was all over. I found myself waking out of a deep sleep. The first thing I saw was the face of the man who I had murdered. It did not scowl at me. On the contrary, it smiled benevolently. Jack, old top, you did me a real good turn when you shot me, said Harold Ingersoll. I had fallen madly in love with his wife, and she reciprocated my passion, for she had grown tired of the strange, detached, unworldly man she had married. Harold Ingersoll was a writer philosopher, a dreamer of dreams who had inherited about $10,000 from his father, and a visionary soul from his mother. While he worked hard at his legal profession, which he found only moderately profitable, his wife read Paracelsus in Swedenborg. The happily married assorted pair never agreed, and I, as a friend of the family, had no difficulty in winning the affections of the woman who had married the offspring of an unimaginative lawyer and a petticoated spiritualist. Harold had published six impossible novels. By the publication, every one of them, he lost money. And when at last the reviewers began to take notice of his latest and most extravagant book, it was almost penniless. Laura, who loved life, was disgusted with her husband's indifference and to a practical consideration. I interested her by continually talking about the rise and fall of the stock market. Her husband despised sport, speculation, and the movies. Laura worshipped all three. She played tennis and hockey and went regularly to baseball matches. I accompanied her while Harold stayed at home reading or writing. 
The affair went on pleasantly for five years, when suddenly Harold, no longer able to bear the irritation caused by Laura's sneers and reproaches, began to turn on her and sometimes abused her. One night, Laura and I were out late and came back to her husband's house shortly after daybreak. Harold came out to meet us at the hall door and sarcastically quoted a well-known passage in Byron's Don Juan. This made me feel ridiculous, and under an impulse of uncontrollable anger, I drew my automatic revolver and shot him dead. Laura fainted. I was arrested, tried, and found guilty. Before the day fixed for my execution, I made a will, leaving all I had in the world to Laura. My last moments were by no means painless. Those who pretend that the electric shock which kills the convicted criminal is not terrible are liars or ignorant fools. But here I was in the next world, and the man I had killed had assured me I had done him a service by shooting him. No words can describe the place where I and my victim met. It was not so much a place as an atmosphere. I might say that I reclined on air, for my body seemed to have no weight or no substance. Harold's face was just as it had been during his earthly life, with this difference. There were no angles, no protuberances, in a countenance which had always looked bizarre. When I killed him, he was between thirty and forty. His eyes were blue with a slightly sardonic expression. He was clean-shaven and slightly bald. His face had all these characteristics still, but the animal traits had vanished. I realized that, in spite of his bodily vesture, he was a spirit. His first words astounded me. Talk of forgiving injuries and loving your enemy. Harold, you are too kind to the scoundrel who took your life away. I faltered. Not at all, said Harold, and his smile grew warmer. I thought of suicide as a way out. Laura, you know, was a nuisance. She hated my ideas. She called them nonsense. She often told me I should become a stockbroker instead of writing books that did not pay. Of course, she did not understand that I was indifferent to what men like you call success. I gradually came to the conclusion that the greatest curse is birth and that the true ideal is to cease to live. I treated her with scorn in order to make you attack me in her defense. It was all right. I asked myself, whether this was not a posthumous nightmare, the cordiality of my victim almost brought tears to my eyes. It was some time before I could utter a word. Anyhow, Harold, we are both dead now, I said. Yes, but we are saved. The situation was becoming bewildering. Saved? How could we be saved? I asked him what he meant, and his smile became irrepressible. I mean just what I say, Jack. Your worldly clergymen don't come within a million miles of comprehending these things. God does not condemn human nature. He only condemns the distortion, the depravity of human nature. My wife had an antipathy to my philosophy of life. She hated my views. You liked her. Possibly you would contend that you loved her. But I displeased, or rather horrified her. When I insulted her, as she and you might have put it, you shot me. I wanted to die. Don't you see? Every one of us was right according to our own logic. His Socratic convincingness made me feel, at the same time, intellectually satisfied 
and spiritually remorseful. Could it be that he was fooling me, and that the course he was taking was the most subtle form of vengeance? But it was soon manifest that Harold had spoken with a candor far greater than he had ever exhibited on earth. He now gently drew me from my reclining posture, so that we moved forward arm in arm. The landscape was beautiful. There were no fields, no trees, no streams, no houses, but life in its fullest emanation filled my very soul with happiness. You now can do just as you like, Jack, said Harold. We are free from the bonds of our world that we have shaken off like the dust of our feet. After a pause, he asked, Would you go back to Laura if you could? I felt myself a new man, a spirit growing out of the miserable bondage that is the lot of the human brute. No, I replied emphatically. For weeks before the end came, I had ceased to care for her. Then, in that world of spirits, we clasped hands. I hope you enjoyed After, by author Dennis Francis Hannigan, as performed by yours truly. As a reminder, all of tonight's tales were drawn from the December 1924 edition, Volume 4, Number 4, of the legendary pulp fiction magazine, Weird Tales. If you're interested in checking out more fantastic stories from that issue, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and check out the notes for today's episode. You'll find a link to where you can check out the entire issue, which contains not just the five tales performed today, but more than a dozen others. I think you'll find that even though nearly 100 years have passed since these spooky tales were published, that the same things that terrified previous generations still creep us out today. I suppose some things never change, I'd like to personally thank you for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase a season's pass for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Gyrie channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Story Time, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Gyrie. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep, if you can. <laughs>
Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Programs artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, the Otis Jivey channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? Ha <laughs> ha